All right, welcome everyone. Thanks so much for being here and thinking about um, planning our legacy. And um, we're gonna be watching a video of a conversation from Beth Stipe of the North Central Washington Community Foundation with a local Wenatchee attorney from 2019. We'll watch about 20 minutes or so of, of that. And then we have Julia Yetter here, who's one of the Met How at Home board members. I'll let her introduce herself. Um, just talk to us some more about um, legacy planning and you just be open to conversation ideas and questions and because it's such a unique and creative process really and and so I'm looking forward to this conversation today and I'll pass it to you Julia. Hi everybody I'm Julia Yetter. Um, I'm an attorney located in Twisp and then I spent some time in Olympia and um, Currently, I'm working with Northwest Justice Project, um, and in the past, I've done private um, family law, estate planning, um, and uh, prior to that, I did child welfare uh, law, so I have some experience in this area, and I also um, created a nonprofit uh, to provide legal services to people that are low income. So I'm pretty familiar with um, nonprofit law and sort of how to set up gifts. And I've helped people to create legacy gifts in the past as part of their estate planning. So I'm happy to talk to you more about that and maybe just give you some examples of what um, other people have done and how they've kind of decided where to focus that giving. Fantastic. Any uh, questions before we watch the 20 minutes video. Okay, I will be sharing my screen. Hopefully this goes smoothly and, uh, and we'll be back together in about 20 minutes. Oh, I hate it when this happens. Okay, let's try this. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Can you all see it? Yes. Wait, this is not the right thing. Okay, just one minute. Why did that come up? I had it all queued up. Sometimes if you finish the video, it'll go on to the next one. If you don't set it back, maybe that's what happened. I don't know. Okay. Learning there is a go. lifelong adventure. Beth, thinking about it, you know, in the work you do with the Community Foundation, you know, what's the best way for someone to really leave a legacy? Even, you know, I think about a lot of individuals that say, well, I'm not rich. I don't, I don't have all this, this wealth of money or assets. How do I still make a difference? Well, um, what I would say is that community foundations and charitable organizations all throughout this region uh, are supported by people who um, none of us would say are rich uh, because we all think about philanthropy and the Gates Foundation and the, the, the Warren Buffetts. And really, truly, when you look around this country and you look around this community in particular, the people who do give and give generously are people just like you and me. There are teachers, there are, there are people who work in our communities, there are orchardists. And I can tell you story after story about people who have left a legacy with the Community Foundation who you would have never thought that um, they would have done something like that. And today they're supporting students going to college because that was important to them. Or they're supporting their church. Uh, you know, they've given gifts all throughout their lives to their church and they wanna make sure that the church is still um, given their generosity after they're gone. And so the, at the Community Foundation, we're lucky enough that we get to do those kinds of things. So uh, I would say everyone in this room has an opportunity to make a legacy gift uh, to support things that are important to them in this community. And um, I know I love living here and I know that I have benefited from people who have come before me who have left a gift. 
and uh, I plan to do the same thing because I know that there are people that are come, going to come after me, uh, and it's my job to do the same thing, to make sure that we all take care of each other. Because if we don't do it, no one else is going to, and our community will suffer. So does someone need to include like a, a specific charity or the community foundation in their will, or are there other ways that they can give? Sure, there, there are lots of different ways that I think people don't think about. Um, so certainly the estate gift, the bequest is a very common way that people leave a legacy gift in their community. And what we find is that most people don't just have one charity that they support. They support multiple charities. Uh, there are many things that they, they have loved during their lifetime that they will make sure um, they have something to leave to them afterwards, in addition to their loved ones. Um, but also things that we don't often think about. You know, when we're young and we have young children, sometimes we'll have uh, a paid up life insurance plan and then we forget about it because we're older now and our children are grown and they have their own families and you know the purpose of having that life insurance was to protect those kids if we were to suddenly die and, and they were minors and that's a gift that can be given to a, a charity of any any flavor uh, at any time. Same thing with designated or beneficiary de designations on your IRAs. Um, oftentimes those are really great assets to leave to charity because uh, if you leave them to your loved ones, that you'll be taxed on those or your loved ones will be taxed on those gifts. And so what we see is that if people say, gosh, I would really like to do something for charity, um, talking again to a professional advisor about, well, what's a good gift to leave to charity and what's a good gift to leave to my kids? You know, maybe there's the house or a life insurance policy or other things. And so really understanding kind of what the breadth of your assets are because most people have assets of some sort. They have a house, they have a car, um, and people don't think about that when they think about their wealth. They think about, gosh, what's my checking account? And really, we have so much more than that uh, to consider um, when we're making these plans about how, what we want to leave our children and our friends and to our community. Do you have any other, uh, I'd love to tell, you know, case studies around um, different examples of ways that people can do a, either charitable giving or be well prepared or structure their will. Do you have any case studies that you would like to share? Well, I mean, when you think about estate planning and people's wills, what's, I think part of what I love so much about it is that it's unique. You know, every, every situation is different. Every family is different. There's a lot of the same things. We have so many of the same tools. We've got that general power of attorney to handle your financial affairs. There's the medical power of attorney. There's the will. So like the types of documents are the same, but the way they're carried out is very individualized. And I think that's one of the powerful aspects of having estate planning is that you get to decide what's happening. And it's not just falling under the Washington state law if you pass away without a will. Because that's what happens. If you pass away without a will, you're subject to just what the state uh, legislature has said, this is where your assets should go. And that may not be what your desires are. And so your will lets you say, I want to give some additional money to, or a small scholarship to the kid who lives down the street who's mowed my lawn and comes help me rake the leaves every year of his life. And now that he's a grown up, he still comes back and visits me. I mean, it gives you the ability and the flexibility to do that, um, which I think is really a phenomenal thing we have. Uh, there's also in Washington um, the ability to specifically write lists for your own personal effects for your household affairs or your household items. And I see that as being a, also a very um, critical way to share with those um, the legacy you want to leave behind. You know, in your will, you may not list out. I want my grandmother's tea set to go to Henry and I want my father's tools to go to Jacob. You may not say those sort of things in your will because then your will would just be way too long. But in Washington, you have the ability to write a list out and do that. And I think that's really a wonderful way to be able to just continue sharing um, 
what you want in your life and what you want to give to others. So my mother-in-law puts masking tape on the back of furniture. Does that work? <laughs> it doesn't, and my mother does the same thing. <laughs> She does it, my sisters and I, she puts a different colored sticker for each of us and we tease her that we're gonna go around switching the colors. <laughs> but no, you have to have it in writing and it needs to be dated. Well, that's good to know. All right, very good. Well, we have, um, you know, we have a few, we have lots of stories at the Community Foundation about people who have left, left legacy gifts, but I think I'm gonna talk about one in particular because we have, um, some charitable remainder trusts that we trustee. And these are also really interesting um, vehicles uh, to both support a child or a beneficiary during their lifetime and then to leave a legacy gift um, afterwards. And we have one donor that established a charitable remainder trust and she had a very long history with cancer care in the community. It's the organization that provides housing for folks who are here doing treatment. And so uh, when she passed away, she established a charitable remainder trust and she has two uh, grown children, but both are disabled. And so the community foundation is able to provide them with an income on a monthly basis. And then once those two children pass away, then the remainder of that trust will go to cancer care. And so it was a wonderful way to not uh, have to have to take care of those adult children without giving them the entire bequest and also still being able to do a charitable gift um, after those kids have passed away as well. So I think those are some really interesting things that people do, like you say, no two are alike. We're all going to be individuals about how we do this, but um, really spending the time to think through kind of what your values are and what your hopes and dreams are with your estate plan your charitable giving, how, what you want to leave those family members, both maybe on an asset side, but also on a value side, is I think a really important piece to consider. Pibus University, where learning is a lifelong adventure. Pibus University, where learning is a lifelong adventure. Why don't you share with us maybe some of the the key things that you like to talk to people about when they're Hi everyone, I just wanted to check the waiting room really quickly and I'm so glad I did because there are people waiting <laughs> in the waiting room. So welcome, welcome those of you who've been in the waiting room. I'm so sorry I started the <laughs> video and then I realized there might be people sitting in the waiting room, and sure enough, <laughs> my son at record keeping, they do a wonderful job of the books. They know how I want to run my affairs, and so that's the person I'm going to appoint. Hi, is that Annie? Annie, are you talking to us? <laughs> I don't know, maybe not. Um, we can we'll go back to this video and continue with it, but maybe um, maybe one of you or could volunteer to just kind of fill in what you heard in those first few minutes there. What uh, it's a conversation with Beth Stipe of the North Central Washington Community Foundation, and it's just that's such an amazing organization. They run our Give Met How campaign here. They do so many things um, for North Central Washington. And, um, and she's having a conversation with Eileen, uh, some, Colleen, no, Colleen somebody, Fry, Colleen Fry, an attorney. And um, so they're just starting to talk about different ideas for legacy planning and um, anything that stuck out to uh, any of you, Sheila, Louise, Julia, Kelly, or Antonia? I know I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> well, I've been putting masking tape on items around the house that I want to go to specific nieces and nephews. So now I know I have to write it down. The masking <laughs> tape won't be legal enough. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that was a good point that in Washington State, you can, you know, write up those those lists in order for them to to be legal. Yeah, 
Let's see. I'm going to mute Ellen. I think she <laughs> didn't realize she got let in to the event, maybe. Um, another piece is just knowing, you know, that the community foundation is is there and we're going to learn more too about the role of the community foundation in helping to do some of this estate planning and legacy giving but the other big uh point that you know beth stipe made that i thought was good is just that it's for everyone and you don't have to have super wealth in order to 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 do some legacy planning and uh, try to set up some creative ways to make a difference once you're gone. Any, well, we've any... just sat down with Michael, the lawyer, and, and identified community organizations we want to receive our money and said this percent, this percent, this percent. And then that was six years ago and we've forgotten about it. So I'm here to find out if we should do something more. Uh, certainly review what we wanted then, but is there more we should do? That's a great question, Louise. Yeah, and um, they'll dig in a little bit more here, but I think it's a great thing to always revisit and take a look and say, are these still the same, you know, organizations? Do they still all exist or is there new? Yeah, that's, it's definitely good to go back and, and look at that thing. Look at, look at the overall picture. Okay, so yeah, Lisa. Can I ask? Um, I'm I'm in Michigan, and awesome. <laughs> thank you. And I'm part of this because I thought it sounded interesting, but I don't know. Um, I'm probably going to have to talk to someone here, right, for state state types of things. Right, but and there are community foundations all over the nation, um, mm -hmm. and so you could look and see what your local community foundation is and they're a great place to go um, to set things up and to kind of inventory your overall um, estate and decide how to take care of yourself throughout the rest of your life. And do you, um, you have basic information though, that um, I'm sorry, I wasn't here at the beginning. I teach piano lessons and I, I just got home and I'm sorry, I'm late. Yeah, yeah, no, no problem. <laughs> but um, is, is there something I can hook into and kind of look at? Um, yeah, I'll, I will share this video that we're watching. And the, the first 26 minutes of it are, are more general. And we've already done a program for MetHow at Home around some of the general estate planning. But I thoughts could look at it at another time, right? I could. Yeah, exactly. So I'll have your email and I'll, I'll um, send out an email to everyone with the link to this video. And I can also send out the link to the um, program that Meredith Grigg from Northwest Justice Project did for us as well. She did a great job of giving a very broad overview of the lay of the land, you know, choosing your power of attorney, both for finances and medical and that sort of thing. And that's oh, yeah. not what this um, session is about. This session is just primarily about legacy planning. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah. Anything else before I head back? Okay, hopefully I can find the video. <laughs> thinking about giving a charitable gift. So the first thing we always talk to them about is um, making sure that if they're doing a charitable gift during their lifetime, that they have assets to ensure that they're going to be protected during their lifetime. So we want to make sure that folks don't, because we see a lot of folks that are charitable that really want to come in and they want to start that scholarship now because they want to see those kids going to school. And we want to make sure that that's great, but that they have the assets that they need to live the rest of their life. So that's the first most important thing. And then after that is 
you know, what can we do to make sure that your wishes are fulfilled? And so oftentimes um, we will get a letter from an attorney that a gift has been left to the community foundation with very little instruction. And so we really encourage people. We love it when they come and tell us that they're going to do an estate <clears throat> gift uh, so that we can chat with them and capture what it is that they're trying to do. Because if we get it in the will as an estate gift after they're gone, we can't ask them any questions. And maybe, maybe it wasn't clear to us, you know, gosh, do they want, uh, just students from Wenatchee High School, or did they want Wenatchee High School and Cashmere High School? It wasn't quite clear. So those are the things that we worry about in our office is that uh, we're not sure what the donor's intent are. So coming and visiting with us and letting us know, and you know, it's it's never an obligation, right? As, as Colleen said, if you decide you wanna put a charitable gift in your will today, and your circumstances change 10 years from now, or there's a new nonprofit in, in the organization or, or in the community that you wanna support, or you've changed churches, um, those things can easily be changed in your estate plan. But making sure that you have them in there is really important. So we talked to folks about that. We also have a will kit on our uh, website, which is cfncw.org. And that's a very robust um, document that kind of walks you through all the different steps, both around what you want to leave your friends and family, but also what you might want to leave your community. So that's a resource that's free to anyone, and you can just uh, go onto our website and check it out. And uh, it's, I'm sure, total overkill, but some people might really like that. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, to back that up, I know you've heard this a lot from both Beth and I tonight, but it's start the process. You know, if you if you have a will and you're wanting just to take a look at it, make sure it still covers everything you want. That's the first step. If you don't have a will, talk to your um, attorney, talk to your financial advisor, so they can help craft and share what you want to do and how you want to leave leave your legacy. But just got to start somewhere and taking those first steps. I assure you, you will feel so great having that relief and just having that peace of mind, knowing that you've been the one to decide what kind of legacy you want to leave. Well, I think, Colleen, I think that that brings us to probably the question that everyone wants to ask is, how much is this going to cost me? Because, you know, attorneys are expensive. So what is it? what would it cost me to do these really important documents that you've been talking about all night? Well, certainly. Um, you know, as with your estate planning being unique, there, you know, the the intricacy and the sophistication of the planning is also unique. And so where you're talking about really a, you know, a straightforward uh, basic set of estate planning documents, you know, you're probably looking at a couple of hours of legal time. And so you have to think about that. You have to budget that and think about how it is an investment in yourself and in you know, the future that you want to leave. Um, and then, you know, to the extent you have, you know, special situations or tax planning that goes into it, then it may be more complicated. But one thing that's really fantastic is your, the attorneys that you meet with will be able to talk with you about that. They'll be able to share with that to say, no, I think this project's going to take me two hours of time or, well, we also have some additional, we want to do some additional planning here and you have these matters you want to address. And so maybe we're looking at four hours of time. You know, you really, that's part of that process and the communication, but you have to start the conversation in order to figure it out. It's, you know, estate planning. And the reason why I'm telling you just, you know, start the process is because don't let that be an impediment to you getting estate planning in place. Think about how you're investing that amount of time and those those costs into yourself and your family, so they can avoid having to go through, you know, a potentially drawn out legal battle or other issues that could be way more expensive and certainly more heartache at the end. Ibis University, where learning is a lifelong adventure. Pibus University, where learning is a lifelong adventure. But we also wanted to give you a chance to ask your own questions. And so, we have an audience member, sir. I have a two part question. After a death, is there someone responsible to ask the family if there is a will? You know, like in the city or the state or something? So, we do 
do here in our local Chelan Douglas Bar Association. Mm -hmm. um, there is a family member who says, so-and-so has passed away. I'm not sure if there's a will. Our local bar association sends out an email asking every attorney in our area if they're holding a copy of, of a will for that individual. And so if you don't run across it in you know, the file cabinet or maybe hiding in the freezer where they kept all their other uh, special documents, then, you know, you can always contact <laughs> the local bar association to attempt to, to locate that will. And often those get found in someone's files. Mm -hmm. um, one thing my office does when we hold wills is um, when someone passes away, we do reach out to the family members just to notify them that we have a will. So. And I think many other law firms in town do that as well. Uh, those retired attorneys, when, uh, for the most part, their files get pulled into other individuals' offices for that precise reason. So you can keep and maintain those original documents. So depending on the situation, uh, you can have an estate that does not go through probate and the statute provides the specifications on it. One of it is where um, your estate is below a certain dollar threshold. You're not required to go through probate. Um, also, if there's no real estate involved, um, you're not required to go through probate. So there are situations where you could have a will or have an estate, but it doesn't go through the court process of probate. So that's a great question, Greg. Uh, there is a someone in the, I'd say last two or three years, both a federal statute and then a Washington state statute that mirrors it about uh, essentially passwords and digital access. And uh, many of the companies like Gmail is an easy example. <laughs> where they have their own protocols on who can and cannot access someone's um, password and digital information. And so um, in estate planning documents, we make sure that we grant the fiduciary that right and authority to get that access. And so you'd be able to take, you know, the copy of the will that says, yes, the personal representative has the ability to access all of my digital accounts. And then the, you know, the bank that has the digital online accounts or Gmail or whatever will be able to then grant you that access. So that's a good point. If you have uh, a will that was written in 1980, it's probably time for an update for that little clause alone. So that's a great question. So the question was, if you set up a legacy gift with a community foundation, uh, do you do that through your attorney or through the community foundation? And the answer is you can do it both ways. Um, we work with attorneys all the time to uh, establish a language with the donor, with the client um, that would be embedded in the will. And we also have done it where the client comes to see the community foundation. We fill out the fund agreement with their wishes in it, and then it becomes an attachment to the will uh, and just reference. And so that's an easy way to, if you decide again to change beneficiaries, like if you want to support your church and the Humane Society and your alma mater, uh, but maybe you decide you don't like your alma mater anymore, you can just come to us and we can like make a new one instead of having to go back and change the will and we can just add that in as an, an attachment. So we've done it both ways. So it, the question was if, if a family member doesn't have a will and then they're going through the process, uh, the process they're going through is called intestate succession and that word just means without a will. So intestate, testate being having a will. And so that family member can still, you'd go through a court probate process, but it's the intestate process, which just has some additional restrictions in court oversight because of the fact that the person who is administering the estate um, wasn't necessarily appointed directly by the decedent. And so the court just watches things in a different fashion, but it's a similar probate process. Um, the issue and the concern is that you don't have the benefit of the will. You don't have the benefit of knowing if that individual wanted to do something different than what's set up under the Washington state intestate succession laws, um, which is what you're, you're carrying out in the event that someone passes away without a will. So the state of Washington sets up 
Who receives what under the will? It's under Washington state law. To the extent you have all that background information, it's certainly useful. Um, as with any appointment, the more information you bring to it, kind of the better informed you are to be able to have discussions or look at different ideas. But um, the key thing is really, again, knowing who the members of your family are and um, what your general desire is for them. And that starts the process. If you have copies of your bank accounts or a copy of a life insurance policy or um, you know something other along those lines, that's always beneficial, but it's not required. If the will was valid in that other state, it's valid here as well. That said, when you live in Washington you, and you start to accumulate assets here in Washington, uh, Washington law may provide some differences on how those assets are owned. Uh, Washington's a community property state, so that means if you're married, then you know you start creating different ownership types in your assets here in Washington versus a state that may be a separate property state where uh, spouses can own things separately. So it's always a good idea, say you moved from Idaho and now you're living here in Washington, it's still a good idea to take a look at things, um, make sure that there aren't any nuances with Washington that you need to update on your will. Wonderful. Well, again, thank you all for coming out on this snowy night and let's give Colleen a big hand. <laughs>
to someone with um, with the specification of how you want that um, money to be spent, right? And then that organization or foundation is obligated to do its best to comply with your specifications. There are some exceptions, like if you ask them to do something that becomes impossible uh, for a number of reasons, then there's usually backup language where the board of that organization or somebody else is taxed with kind of trying to find the next closest thing to what you specified or to direct the money in a way that furthers other charitable ventures that that um, foundation or organization might be involved with. So I think that would probably be an easier way for you to achieve what it sounds like you're interested in doing if you have a specific um, idea in mind for where you want that money to go, especially when you're talking about having um, income that continues to accrue um, even after uh, you've passed, right? And that's common. So um, that can be accounted for in a directed gift where you want to support the education of young uh, Asian girls, right? And so that goes to an organization that does that and it's directed specifically to girls from Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, and specifically to kids from kindergarten to eighth grade and scholarships. And so they would have to do their best to comply with that. And any money that continued to be generated would just go back into supporting that goal. Mm -hmm. And maybe put a uh, amount per year to be released or something like that. Say. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. That's helpful. Thank I you. I think too that, um, you know, I'm not, if you did go through either the North Central Washington Community Foundation, or there's other one, there's probably one on the west side as well. It'd be worthwhile going and talking to them because, like, for example, there's a, um, a Mary Keesaw scholarship mm -hmm. that's happening here. And right now it's at a level where they could, where twi it's done in conjunction with Twist Works to give two $1,000 scholarships every year. And there's enough in there where they can continue to do that for a certain amount of time, but they've been, you know, in the last couple of years wanting to, to give three. And so they need to double the, that principal amount in order for those scholarships to be given in perpetuity. And mm -hmm. it's the community foundation that's managing the overall investment. So that is going to be able to be continually given, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm familiar with that one. Thank you. Yeah. Oh yeah, I always do this. I forget that that I that it just says host M A H up here. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I don't know if I introduced myself as Tracy Sprower, and uh, <laughs> all these details. Yeah. Any other thoughts or questions? either from the video or something that you brought? Louise. Uh, I have a simple question. What exactly are the responsibilities of the executor of your estate? Oh. Well, the executor has a lot of responsibilities um, and some of them are pretty general. Um, the main responsibilities are to protect and maintain the assets of the estate, right? For the beneficiaries. Um, so that means making sure that um, everything that's part of the estate is preserved, accounted for, and secured, and um, that they're basically taking care of it and not making any distributions until they're authorized to do so, right? So that's a common problem that I see as an attorney is that people want to start doing distributions from the estate, and you can't do that until a number of preliminary steps have been taken. Um, and one of those is sending notice to any potential creditors, right? You're not allowed to start making distributions until you make sure that all the debts um, and any creditors have been paid, right? And then once you get through that, then you start making um, distributions and paying out and you always have to try to act in the best interest of the beneficiaries. So you couldn't just say, I'm going to and you can't undervalue assets either, like when you're tasked with selling off assets and then distributing proceeds to beneficiaries, you can't just sell, um, you know, the million dollar property to your friend Joe for a hundred dollars because that's not in the best interest of the beneficiaries, right? You have to try to get a maximum value for them when you're selling. 
So um, they have a lot of responsibilities that kind of come down to just being um, prudent and fiscally responsible, right? And always remembering that they're serving the beneficiaries and they may also be a beneficiary to some extent um, to part of the estate. But so it's definitely my husband, to talk about with a lawyer. Yeah. If my husband and I were to die in a plane crash, would the executor be responsible for selling our house and dealing with all of our possessions? Yeah, they would basically be in charge of filing, um, starting the probate process, filing copies of the will with the court, notifying the creditors, notifying the beneficiaries, communicating with the banks and all the other agencies where assets may be, right? And sort of doing, uh, making sure that everything's accounted for and then overseeing um, the distribution in accordance with your wishes, right? Mm -hmm. So it is, well, it is a lot of responsibility. Yeah, exactly. I was thinking, oh, my poor brother. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I would add to just something from, from seeing that video. I mentioned a scholarship in my example earlier when I was talking about a foundation because that's a very common um, request that I see people make when they want to leave uh, legacy gifts. But there are all types. And I think someone previously talked about just doing straightforward bequests, right? Like this amount of money that's part of my estate to this charity, to this charity. And that's great because that's simple and that's straightforward. Um, and there's no one size fits all when it comes to estate planning. But there are a lot of really um, incredible tax benefits that are part of estate planning that can reduce um, taxes that your beneficiaries might pay. So if you gift other things that people don't necessarily think about, um, like real estate or life insurance policies or, um, or stocks, you can actually reduce the amount of estate tax um, depending on what's left right in the estate. Um, that the beneficiaries have to pay. So sometimes it's really great to consult with a financial advisor, an accountant, um, and an attorney to figure out how to basically make your assets go further. So sometimes when people are thinking, oh, attorneys are expensive or a financial planner is expensive, a lot of times the money that you save for the beneficiaries of your estate by doing strategic planning in that way will you know, cover whatever you pay to do that planning and then some. At least if you're thinking about the fact that you're saving the people or the organizations that you're leaving gifts to um, from having to pay taxes if you make the gifts in a certain way. So it's, I think that's why it's always great to consult when you're trying to do that. And not like um, that attorney in the video said to kind of let that be something that holds you back. Um, Cause you can start the conversation and you're not then just like stuck in this commitment where you have to pay that fee. If you think that's unreasonable, then you can do less, you can do more. It really depends on on how specific you want to be. And then also what you're, what you're planning to, to give. Oh, sure. Yeah. Julia, do you think there's any benefit? You know, there's a lot of forms online. Um, I'm just speaking for my own self <laughs> that I, I just want to like get something on paper. And is there any benefit if you have a fairly simple estate just to just do something rather than nothing and maybe even consult with an attorney or your financial advisor to make those decisions but then use an online format to yeah definitely you know. i think the more prepared you can be when you go to meet with somebody the the better off you're going to be and the more you're going to get out of it because when you've got that list of assets um whatever they might be property stocks iras insurance policies um, Van Gogh painting, um, you know, a chunk of land in Hawaii, whatever it is, um, you've got all that and you have some idea of the value, right? And you've, you've kind of come up with some of the documentation. Here's the, the copy of the deed. Here's the copy of this to prove ownership. Um, then it helps them to be more efficient in their time with you. And it helps them to quickly identify for you. It looks like, you know, your main assets are in property, right? So if you want to leave this one, um, this chunk of property as a charitable gift, that's going to take care of the majority of the state tax that your beneficiaries are going to have to pay or just completely eliminate it. Right. So then when you leave 
all these other gifts to your nieces and nephews and to your grade school, um, they're not going to have to pay estate tax on that. So um, I think, yeah, there's a lot to be said for just getting organized and looking at it. And there are some really great online tools to help you do that. Um, there's something called Free Will. Um, that's a very good website. They offer some tools. I'm sure LegalZoom has some helpful estate planning tools. I think LegalZoom is a great place to get started. If you have a complicated estate, then that certainly can't be your endpoint. But it's a great it's a great starting point. Um, so those are some some good spots. And then Nolo is another organization that does a lot of uh, free legal. Um, they have a lot of free legal resources on the internet. So I think that those are all good places where you can get started. So Julie, I wanted to um, circle back to the directed gift concept mm -hmm. and um, how, if you were to decide you wanted to set up a gift that would then um, be funded um, in perpetuity or however long the funds last, um, do you do you call out who's going to manage that or how how does that work if you don't have like I don't know a trust or a foundation or something that's that's already been called out to be the manager of the foundation or the man the trustee or the what would that be the trustee of the trust? Sure. Does yeah. Uh, no, it does on on a on a very simple level. If you just had a lump some or a chunk of property or um like i said a van gogh painting or something you just wanted to specify that that would go to um this charitable organization right for the purposes specifically of helping um amputees right like i'm just trying to give a generic example here like this money needs to go for that this organization does a lot with veterans but you want it to specifically go to that and that organization would be legally obligated to take the funds that they made from selling the property or using the, the um, lump sum that you gave them to go towards that end, right? Uh -huh. um, if something to change, let's say that they had to cut out um, that portion of their operations, right? Like um, where they're only working with vets that are having um, family law issues, right? Then they would no longer be able to use that, but the gift wouldn't necessarily fail. They would just have to redirect it to the closest thing. So that's one way to do that. Another more complicated way when you're gonna have um, something that's likely to continue generating income right. would be to set up a trust. And then the trustee would be the one who's responsible for overseeing that. So that's probably the smartest way to do it if, if um, there's going to be continuous um, infusion of funds over the years to do it in a trust. I think that that would probably be what I would recommend. And I would definitely speak to an attorney about that, but I think that'd be the best way to ensure um, that it continues to, to be used the way that you want it to be used. Right. Okay. And that it's managed appropriately. Thank you. Yeah. I liked the, um, the charitable remainder trust too. That was a an idea that I'd never thought of, you know, to have um, a certain amount released to your children. And then once they're gone, then the rest goes to a certain place. Yeah, the other piece too, that was interesting is um, that if you haven't was it an IRA or something like that, that your beneficiaries would have to pay taxes on unless you directly um, bequeath that? Did I get that right? Yeah, there's a lot of really great tax benefits to kind of leaving things to um, charitable organizations as opposed to individuals, especially if you have enough assets to then leave um, if that was your desire, right, to then leave some money to nieces, nephews, children, whatever, you can reduce the amount of tax that they might have to pay depending on how big your estate is. If you take other things and give them to um, charitable organizations, and that's true for um, a number of things, 
um, including like stocks. There's no, the nonprofits won't have to pay capital gains tax when they sell it. So they're gonna get the full value of your donation. Whereas if you just leave that to a relative, they are gonna have to pay uh, a tax on that. Um, same thing for a real estate gift. Um, the property, the donor will be able to get a tax deduction for the appraised fair market value of that property. Um, but then the nonprofit can either keep that property or sell it, and they're not going to have to pay any capital gains tax on it. So there's some really great benefits when you make those donations to charitable organizations that don't exist when you just leave those same assets to people. And I think, yeah, I think that there's something like that for the IRA as well that I'm not 100% sure on, on the details without looking at it, but um, I'm sure it's something like those lines that. Is that true too for life insurance policies? I just was that you're that the beneficiaries would have to pay tax unless you give it to a charitable organization. Depending on the size of your estate, because if your estate is under a certain amount, then you're not going to have to pay estate tax, right? But when you get to larger estates, you will. And so if you have a significant amount of assets, then you will pay estate tax. And for a life insurance policy, if you give it to a charitable organization, they're exempt from um, they're exempt from having to pay a state tax on that. So basically, your gift goes further if you leave that to a charitable organization than to an individual. If that individual is subject to the estate tax because your overall estate is above a certain amount. Can you be right. more specific about what might be that certain amount that makes the difference? You know, I know that they increased it um, a few years ago so that it's higher than it used to be where you start getting taxed, but it changes all the time. So I don't want to guess on the amount, but it is fairly high. Um, I think you're talking, it's a significant, you have to have a pretty significant amount of assets for the estate tax to kick in. Um, like millions? This is I, I know that definitely when you get above a million, the estate tax will kick in because um, I've heard um, people joke and, and complain about it. But uh, certainly I think when you get to that amount, that's true. Um, you know, maybe I can Google it while we're talking because um, I'm curious to see where that is now. I just know that it was increased during the Trump administration. Uh, thank you. Yeah, any other thoughts or, or creative things that you've seen other people do? We definitely have had some really beautiful gifts um, like Red Macomb and um, my brain is just going to totally go, go blank. <laughs> Mike Real just um, was really generous with different nonprofits in the Valley and, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of different, different ways to give and to, uh, to leave that legacy. Hello. Hi. Hi, this is Susan Snover uh, talking about the estate tax. I don't know all the details, but there's a difference between Washington state estate tax and the federal estate tax. And the federal estate tax doesn't kick in until really a high number, but you have to record, report to the federal um, how much money you've got in your state or how much money you've given away. So that's just something to keep, talk to your advisor about. Pay attention to both the federal and the state. Great, thanks, Susan. And, um, whoops. I was just looking at those numbers and there's they're basically ranges, right, for the amount. And I'm seeing that it can start to kick in on the federal level around, it looks like 150,000 and up is, appears to be the first range. And then there's different rates that that gets taxed. And um, you can certainly Google that information as well. Um, and those change quite a lot. So I think it's always good to take a look at them if, if you want to know um, 
what might happen, but it's certainly something your financial advisor could talk to you about as well. Because that that is where it becomes important to think more creatively about how to potentially um, designate beneficiaries, right? Because if you can reduce what your beneficiaries are going to have to pay in taxes because you're um, designating certain assets to charities, then that's a great thing, right? Because at the end of the day, you're making um, your dollars go further. Uh, another comment, it's worthwhile to think about how much money you can give as a tax-free gift to anybody, a, a bunch of people. Uh, I think right now it is $15,000 a year and they don't have to pay taxes on it. And that's one way of reducing your estate, basically tax-free. Uh, and then there are other questions about uh, accounts for college education and whether the parents have done a whatever it is, 29 something or other, uh, where you put money in to pay for college tax-free. Um, if, if you have anything like that in your family, you should check about that. And if you're giving money to your grandchildren for college, whether they should take your money first or they should take their money from the from their parents through the savings account. Hmm. And how you give money to your kids um, or your grandchildren, you can pay for their college expenses if you write the check to the university, if you buy their books or whatever. Um, that's just something to talk about. I don't know all the details. I mean, I'm dealing with it all, but my mind's mush and I can't remember it all, um, but that's something worthwhile. And if you're giving it to your kids, maybe their, or your grandkids, maybe their parents should use their money first because there's a penalty if they don't use it all for education, but depending on how you're giving your money to the grandchildren, it doesn't have to all go for education. You can later on help them buy a house or there are just all kinds of tax things to think about that. Thanks, Susan. Yeah. yeah. And you did talk, I, I somebody came to the door so I didn't hear everything, but you did talk about IRA donations to charity and how you, you can do that each year. And then that reduces your tax bill because you don't have to pay tax on those earnings from the IRA. And that's very simple to do. OK. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for being here. Yeah, it's I've gone through a couple sudden deaths where there was no will. And um, it's just makes it a lot, a lot more complicated. So that's great well, when we can just all the work. things you have to do when somebody dies, you know, canceling magazines and dealing with this, that, and the other thing. The best the advice my lawyer gave me is that if you're dealing with all this stuff and it's not going right and you're getting frustrated, you just hang up, call again another day. Maybe you'll find somebody else who knows what's going on and will help you. So, that's great. I have hung great. up on a lot of people. I have <laughs> talked to a lot of people and say, let me speak to your supervisor because I couldn't understand what they were saying and you know all that kind of stuff. So call tomorrow, you might get somebody better. That's great. <laughs> and just so everyone knows, I cut and pasted some of the rates into the chat that I looked up that are current. So that kind of gives you an idea of the ranges and the brackets. Um, but I would still encourage you to follow up with a, a financial planner and attorney. Mm -hmm. Did you talk at all about setting up a trust, um, dividing your estate and having it some for you and some in a trust, which tax rate is different and there are all kinds of reasons for doing that. I wish we had set up a trust ahead of time and then I wouldn't have to go around doing all this stuff, but it's worth doing. 
Yeah, I think trusts are a really great tool for a number of reasons. They have a lot of advantages. Um, there are a lot of benefits to them, but it will require um, working with an attorney to do mm -hmm. that. But I, I strongly recommend it. I think that they're great. They're such a wonderful tool um, and you can use them for so many things. So if you think that's something that you might at all be interested in, or you're even just curious if that's right for you, I would absolutely have that discussion with your financial planner, your attorney to, to look into whether or not you could do estate planning with trusts. And kind of back to Kelly's question, maybe I didn't totally understand because a lot of this is foreign to me, but what's the difference between a trust and a foundation? Julia, uh, do you know? I don't, I mean, maybe the lawyer can tell more to. Yeah, I mean, a foundation is essentially an, indie, an entity that has um, IRS approval to operate um, that meets a number of restrictions and requirements with regard to how it's funded and how it spends its assets. And it's extremely regulated. A trust is basically, um, an estate planning tool that anybody can set up and they can have designated purposes. There's somebody at the trustee that has to oversee that and make sure that the assets of the trust are distributed um, as directed. And um, it's basically, it, I think it's much easier to set up. It's less regulated. Um, and that's a really great everyday tool for most people. Um, having a foundation is something that, um, if, if that's something you wanted to do, you would want to try to set that up, I think, during your lifetime so you could get it started and then make sure that it was going to be overseen the way that you hoped it would be. But it's, it's very complicated, um, and I don't think that that's going to be uh, useful for most people. Just for financial planning arrangements, if you put some of your money in a trust, you still get the income that that money makes during the year. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I don't know, my lawyer told me why this is a good thing and that's what I'm gonna do. But I, as I said, my mind's mush. I can't remember all that stuff, but um, the principal doesn't go away, but, and you get the interest on the money. So that's the benefit then you need a, a special tax number because you have a trust trust and all that. But. Great. Well, it is six minutes after five. Any last questions? Thanks so much for joining us. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Thank you for doing this. Mm. Yeah, you. you bet. And I will go ahead and send the um, link to the whole video if anyone wants to watch the first 26 minutes. So. And do you send out the links to the previous programs or are they on the Meta at Home website? They are the one with Meredith Grigg, but I'll add that to, to the um, email to this group. Um, cause Meredith's was very general, you know, um, but had a host of different legal planning, um, pieces in it. So it's, it's helpful. And her slideshow was, was helpful too. She had a great slideshow. So, okay. All right. Thanks, Tracy. Thanks, Julia. Mm -hmm. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Goodbye. Thanks so much. Good to see you all.